Thank you, Prithvi, and the rest of the ecology faculty. That was a fabulous um, start to the, this um, day. Very interesting discussion. I learned a tremendous amount, and I will think twice again before I enter an eye, especially in total retinal detachment type case. Thank you. Um, it is my true honor um, to introduce our next Knights uh, Templar Eye Foundation um, keynote lecturer, um, Brenda Galley. As you can tell, she wears many, many hats. She's the director of retinal blastoma programs, not only one department, but two, and six um, Sick Kids Hospital in Toronto and Alberta Ch Children's Hospital in Calgary. She's associate science and lead health informatics research at Techna Institute and Cranbell Research Institute, University Health Network um, in Toronto. She's a professor of the departments of ophthalmology and medical biophysics and medical genetics at the University of Toronto in Canada. She leads team at six um, sick kids that is uh, that has developed a state of the art care for retinoblastoma across really all of the Canada. She has more than 40 years of experience in this um, um, in this um, research arena, and she really is implementing a novel retinoblastoma point of care database, the Bict Health to improve understanding of the treatment course and to support lifelong multidisciplinary shared care. So without further ado, I would please ask you to help me welcome Brenda Galley. And her title of her talk is New Green Landscape for Retinoblastoma. Thank you, Brenda. Well, thank you very much. I've really enjoyed this meeting. I, I've not been to this meeting before, but it's just had a wonderful atmosphere of discussion and collegiality and fantastic new ideas. I've learned a great deal here yesterday and this morning. And thanks to the panel who did a marvelous introduction to what I'm going to talk about. I'm going to talk about, uh, first of all, I will say I do not have a disclosure slide, but I'm only paid to care for children at the Hospital for Sick Children and Calgary with, uh, uh, as a salary in both places. So none of the other, it, many of these um, icons on this slide um, actually donate, raise money for the research that I'm going to talk about. None of it passes through my hands. <laughs> Green, green, what do I mean by green? What on earth am I going to talk about here? So this is my last slide. Don't read the details yet, but I'm going to end up with seven points on why uh, the care for retinoblastoma at the present time is very, very exciting because a lot of things are changing that will make the care greener for the patient. The patient will suffer less, endure less, and have better outcomes. And our real goal, which I haven't mentioned much in my talk, is that no child should die of retinoblastoma anywhere in the world. So the first piece there is life, vision, and eye. That's the first thing to recognize, that life is more important than vision and more important than an eye. And that concept has come out strongly and it was reiterated here. However, um, I would uh, appreciate discussion over which comes first, vision or eye? What's the priority there? Is a blind, dangerous eye worth saving? So that's a, I, I won't answer that. <laughs> so the standard of care for retinoblastoma in 2019, uh, and of course there, there could be variations on this that I won't put here, but this is very much the, the sort of textbook and what you've already been brilliantly led through this morning. Um, I'll start though with uh, classification. Um, we all still use A, B, C, D, E as if they're all one standard, but they're not one standard. And that was recognized and the paper, the American Journal of uh, the the Ameri AJCC Cancer Staging Manual, which has cancer staging delineated for all different cancers. The eye is included, and retinoblastoma has a chapter. Ashwin Malapatna led that chapter with many, many people internationally working on the content of that. It, but the data in that chapter is in part partly consensus across the world, but partly based on a survey we did, which had 
1,067 patients scored for the uh, possibility that an eye with certain features could be saved. We're not talking mortality because the mortality in the whole study was very low. This included 19 centers around the world who entered data into a database, which was sort of similar to our the, the Depict Health that was nicely introduced, which I'll talk more about. Um, and that showed that the, there was a problem. The data that was submitted was features of the eyes, and then the algorithms designate, classified the eyes by five different classifications, starting with the Reese Ellsworth, which was developed in the 1960s, basically to predict outcome of radiation to the eye, to possibly to save the eye, and working all the way through to the ABCDE. But there's two versions of the ABCDE that are critically different. And the Murphy version, published in 2005, uh, did not take into any consideration the size of the tumor in the eye. In other words, he felt from his observations that size didn't matter to the ability to save an eye. Even very large tumors could respond. Um, the other version, published in 2006, the Shields version, um, put 50% volume, more than 50% volume of tumor into D. And that meant that eyes would be moving from D to E if they had a larger tumor. And that changes everything. But this, this, this survey showed that um, that mushes all these and these together, meaning you can no longer tell which eyes should be enucleated. Murphy said E stands for enucleation. So the new classification, the eighth edition, is C, CT, uh, following the standard for all cancers. And T1 are very small. T2 are the ones really can the eye can be saved, and T3 should all be high level consideration to enucleation. So I'm going to just mention first some exciting things in my number two there. You see the green two. That's the second exciting opportunity as OCT for retinal blastoma. And I'm showing you here a family. The uh, grandmother had bilateral retinal blastoma bilateral nucleation in the 50s saved her life. She lived a wonderful life then died of her second cancer, sarcoma. But she had two children, one who carried her mutation, and I treated that child and has 20-20 in two eyes with small tumors in both eyes. And then that mother, uh, the first H1, um, had two children. The first child is H0, no retinal, no mutation. And the second child diagnosed at uh, 33 weeks gestation to carry the mother's mutation. So the baby was elected to be delivered at 36 weeks gestation instead of waiting because we know at 36 weeks they already have a 30% chance of a vision-threatening tumor. Um, I just didn't mention that H, the H here is derived from the new classification. So retinal blastoma is the only genetic cancer. Isn't that interesting? It's the first genetic cancer that acknowledges in this staging system that heritability has something to do with prognosis. Um, and so it's now the um, um, TNMH, but only for retinoblastoma. The other cancers have to wait for the ninth edition before they can add an H. But it's interesting the way I've used H here. It's so easy to talk to a family about who carries the mutation. Maybe other eye cancers could think about using a similar system instead of having to go into the detail with each patient of what the mutation is, et cetera. That's a bit of an aside. So um, in this particular patient, the uh, little girl with H1 here, right, oops, not working, right there, um, when she was, we, we monitor these children in the clinic awake with both RETCAM and OCT, handheld OCT in the clinic. And then um, we all went home and Leslie McKean phoned us. We all watched the OCT. Leslie McKean phoned us and said, you've got to come back. We missed a tumor. And it's because we were watching it happen fast and you've got to go through every slice of the OCT. And this is a tumor that was found later. You can see where it's um, the second image here is when it's already indenting the retinal surface a little bit. It's still quite invisible. But when we went back to our previous 45 days before, it's actually there. And so we missed it because it was only one OCT slice. 
but it was all right because this wasn't threatening vision. And then I show how it's, we, it's hard to find, so we put one laser burn in in order to know where it is because you don't know where to aim the laser. You guess by the blood vessel pattern. And then you add more laser until it's all white, so we use the OCT as well to judge that we've actually not got a geographic miss. And then in follow-up, we can see there's a nice scar and no recurrence, but we also use OCT to use for surveillance for recurrences. So OCT is a key part of managing um, um, focal therapy treatment in retinal blastoma at the kids and Calgary. So for unilateral, the other eye is normal. First line and second line therapy are very reasonable. Um, and all these things have had, we've had a good introduction to them already. Um, third line becomes questionable for a unilateral. The other eye is normal. Should you put the child through all of this, um, taking them away from playing and enjoying life in order to try and save a li an eye that might have vision or not? And so we kind of would put a barrier on that if, unless vision potential is very good. For bilateral last eyes, we do go to the third line therapies, um, in, including at, at the last ditch, external beam radiotherapy still may have a role for an eye that has vision in the last eye. But here we have to keep in mind life versus eye. We have some brand new data, which is now um, just published, uh, showing giving some idea of the clinical features looking at the child to say that there will be low risk pathology in this eye and it would be safe to go through trial eye salvage. And there's only 38 patients in this study, but it does statistically show that if the optic nerve's visible, the macula is visible, and there's less than a quarter of retinal detachment, it's, there, there, none of those eyes had uh, high risk pathology. And all the eyes in the study were enucleated, and this is over uh, in the past when we didn't try to save them it, like this. So that puts a nice um, guide onto which eye to try to save. Another study that was presented at ARVO and is um, submitted now um, from data from China has a much larger N, 544 patients in this study, covering um, four years. And these are all eyes that were enucleated. So it doesn't count the ones that had attempted salvage and, and succeeded. So these are eyes that uh, did not succeed. So that's a, a, a problem of this paper. We don't know about the other ones because we don't have pathology on them. And what it shows very clearly is that pre-enucleation chemotherapy, which is broadly given thinking to try and save the eye, has no survival benefit. Mortality is the main outcome of this study. Um, and, and delay actually worsens survival. So if you try, keep trying to save a group D eye for more than 3.5 months, or a, more than two months for a group EI, you're actually entering into survival risk. So that's important to think about. Nobody knew it so clearly as this right now. Um, this data is very important. But once you enucleate the eye and you see high risk pathology, PT3 or PT4, then Systemic chemotherapy actually has a major impact to improve survival, so it's well worth doing. And it, we could talk more about that, but I don't think I'll take time. It's a very interesting observation. So you'll see vitrectomy, and we've heard about the dangers of sticking a needle in an eye, even to do anything, and now I'm talking about vitrectomy. Well, uh, um, last year, Dr. John Yang, Jun Yang Sao and colleagues uh, let me help them, so I'm an author on this paper, to report the first 21 cases of pars plana vitrectomy and endoresection of refractory retinal blastoma. Um, these cases were all done in the first half of 2013, so there's very long follow-up. And that showed that it was um, um, safe and useful with good vision outcome in a significant portion. But now, um, at um, the ISO meeting recently, so brilliantly led by Jesse and colleagues. Um, Dr. Zhao presented on 159 patients, 174 eyes. 
And you can see that 2% uh, died from the eye that had the PPV um, with optic nerve invasion and blood metastasis, but there was zero evidence that this was related to the um, vitrectomy procedure. There was no anterior disease, which is consistent with the data, international data on the uh, intravitreal melphalan injections. So this child that I show here, the top left picture, um, this is a child in Kenya, and the first picture I, was when I saw her maybe uh, five years ago in Kenya with Dr. Kahaki Kimani, who's a brilliant retinoblastoma um, um, onco ocular oncologist. And then I got pictures sent to me by Kahaki showing vitrea seeding and growing in that mass. They gave many more cycles of systemic chemotherapy. They could not do intravitreal melphalan because they couldn't have the drug in Kenya. And um, I knew in, about the P PPV from China. So we organized that this little girl, and I can use her name, Sharon, went with her parents um, to China, had a PPV, and this is immediately after the PPV. You can see that the tumor has been, the tumor where the tumor was, is surrounded by um, endolaser to stabilize the retina, <clears throat> and the tumor base and all the vitreous seeds are gone. Uh, and then she went back to China to have the silicon oil removed, and we've followed her ever since. She has a nice flat, flat white scar. Her fovea is on the uh, other side of the optic nerve and has 20-20 vision, so this little girl's only other option in Kenya was to lose her last eye. So it's a very exciting, exciting approach that can come in and clean up the refractory issue and cut short all the other things we keep doing, non-green things, that, to invade uh, the child and try to save eyes and vision. So here's Depict Health. Um, this is a child I'm going to that follows through on what I was on the vitrectomy. But first, I'll introduce you to Depict Health. This is a database that is on the cloud, so it can be seen anywhere. The demo is running. It's actually not on the cloud, but soon will be moved to the cloud. Um, and you can go and log in. I'll give you the logins. I'll give you a card with it all written on it. And th this is home base. This is the whole scenario for this child. So you can see that the the um, um, TNM scoring is written up here. So this is both uh, both eyes. Uh, well, the, oh, this is unilateral. You see, this is a TTT zero. Nothing is ever needed for this eye, and this is the CT2B. But this algorithm of the full classification comes from not from the doctors remembering anything. All they do is enter the data, the features of the eye, and the database does the classification, including the H staging. Um, but we have this child is H0 after testing, and the green line shows when the genetic test was done. And it's H0 because no mutation was found in this unilateral patient's blood. But we add an asterisk now, and this isn't in the textbook, um, because there's a residual risk that that child's actually mosaic at a level that we can't detect. Um, if we had tumor, we could maybe find the test with more precision for the second event, or, or for both events that we would find in the tumor, and find more mosaicism. But we don't have tumor at this point. And so um, we add an asterisk for that caveat. So you can see the child has had initially intraarterial chemotherapy. That was the only successful intraarterial chemotherapy. On the second intraarterial chemotherapy, with quite a nice response in the eye, uh, the child actually stroked on the table and ended up in the ICU. This was well managed because she was already still there. They still had a catheter in there. Everything was managed. But she has a tiny little ischemic area of brain that remains. And so what does that mean for this child in her life? She's functionally perfectly normal right now. So we gave her two cycles of systemic chemotherapy. And then all the vitreous seeds had disappeared, so we um, 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 put in a plaque. I'll go on to the next slide. This is what she looked like at the beginning. You can see unilateral, the, the right eye is totally normal, so I'm not showing its timeline anymore. And the tumor is uh, leaving her with an intact 
a fovea, you would guess. And if we go to this picture, you can see in more detail that she has really a very extensive vitreous seeding all over. And here's an OCT across with a normal fovea, an optic nerve, and all this seeding sitting on top of her fovea. But it moves around. So um, that was all at, sorry, that was at diagnosis. So we did all those treatments, including putting a plaque under this. And then we came into this follow-up visit and noted that we couldn't see very well and there was a retinal detachment. So laser near the plaque tumor, this is the um, source of all the seeding, this is the main tumor right here, had caused hemorrhage and um, we projected that there would be a hole, a tear on the edge of the calcified part of the tumor. So. Um, that was quite magical because, um, not because that happened, but because I texted to our retinal surgeon colleague who has moved from Toronto to Hong Kong, Wei Ching Lam, who's done several of these vitrectomies following along the Chinese approach in Toronto. And he woke up and looked at his text and he said, wow, I'm going to Toronto tomorrow. So he was landing, this was Wednesday when we texted him, Thursday he landed in Toronto and we did a vitrectomy on Friday morning. So it was amazing circumstances. He's a very brilliant, careful surgeon, as is Dr. Um, um, Lee, who works with Dr. Xiao in China. Both of them are very calm, quiet people who care a lot about children. And it's quite beautiful to watch the work they do in just the right children, child. So it's a real team of a big retinal expert, um, Dr. Chow, and his retinal surgeon who doesn't choose what to do. He follows the guidance, but ex does it with beautiful precision. So now you can see post, post vitrectomy, what we're left with, and resection, we're left with a broad band. And this is the scar from all the endo laser. And here is normal retina coming up. The retina is now attached, and there's silicon oil in the side at this moment. And here we go to scar. So we're going from attached retina into scar right there. And up here, we're going from scar here into choroid. And there's the choroid, and the, ret the retinoblastoma has been carefully peeled off Brooks' membrane in the choroid. And that's the resection technique. So depict health, here you are. Um, I'll give you cards. It's really uh, uh, easy to get into. Just put in demo user. One thing pe state people sometimes make is they think, they think they should put an S there because this must be secure. It's not secure. I want you all to go and look at it. You can enter patients. You'll see the patients I've talked about here, their timelines. They are all masked. The dates of events are real because we can't make up a retinoblastoma case, but their date of birth and and their names are different, and the children have picked their own name. So they're interesting names. Actually, the first child in, that I showed you, the, uh, whose mother, grandmother died of a sarcoma, her initials are VV, so she's Vincent van Gogh. <laughs> so here's what Depict Health does for the whole team. It, uh, the data is entered by the whole clinical team. The uh, family views and can assign anybody they choose to also view, but they can't enter data. Subsequently, newer versions will get into stress response courts from the parents, et cetera, and the family and the patient and all sorts of other things where they will enter the data and we will only view. But that's not developed at this moment, although the, this is built on a core of e-cancer care, which is within the whole UHN, University Health Network, and uh, there the uh, stress response score is fantastic. Patients co in the waiting room on an iPad um, give indication of how well they're really doing, and that changes their management significantly. And it makes the whole circle of care, including the family, a real team. So that's my number six. You'll see the number six there for, for uh, uh, making things better. <laughs> um, Depict Health is going to, and the secure access portion is already on the uh, Microsoft Azure cloud. The newest version of the database is going to be going up within a month onto the cloud, and then the demo will, will rerun another demo because it still will have things you can make suggestions on how we can make it better before it actually achieves all its governance processes. And there's an extensive governance processes designed, including the organization. For example, all these committees that will oversee this 
are consistent of people who are the leads and the heads and people at all the sites in the world. They'll all take turns participating. And one day, we'll even get to the point where there's inspections, just like along the model of the um, um, pathology, uh, the CAP, College of American Pathology has a beautiful system of each lab inspecting other equivalent labs, and I've done that myself. It's quite fun, it's very exciting, and I see that to work here too. And then everybody is partaking in it and working together to make this all happen. But out of that, the, the data that goes in is identified, but with minimal identifiers, but you can't care for a retinal stoma patient without knowing which patient you're talking about. And we want to be able to invite our colleagues anywhere in the world to look at that patient, and we just give them access to the database. We don't need to send anything through the email. We don't need to talk about it. We just send them the link, and then they can look at everything. And if the patient travels to another center, they would also add data to that patient's record, but it's one patient record everywhere. Then out of that will come um, coded data, that's the real world data, because this isn't a study, isn't a project prospective study. Uh, all the data that happens lifelong um, will then go in and then we'll have brilliant machine learning or artificial intelligence that will feed back to give us better evidence for what we should be doing with the next novel therapy. Here's a child, um, you can see, the child had bilateral nasty retinoblastoma, and you can see the yellow triangle is a nucleation, and this eye was taken out within four months, reflect back to 3.5 months for the DI, would say we need to get it out pretty soon, and that was done. That left us with the other eye, which has had, as you can see from all the symbols, a lot more treatment, and this is what the eye looked like at um, after systemic chemotherapy, intra-arterial chemotherapy, lots of laser, and then the fovea detached. And fovea detached because the main source of tumor sitting here nasal to the nerve had started to grow again. And all the yellow in this drawing, and these are the standard same drawings that have been done for retinoblastoma since 1950s when the indirect ophthalmoscope was used. And it's the same template, same piece of paper, but this is a vector coordinated diagram in the thing. Am I going too long? <laughs> okay, I'll go faster. Okay, so this child had um, um, all these tumors, all th 31 tumors all over here. And then I talked to Lynn Murphy and he introduced me to the fact that the episcleral chemo plaque was ready for being put in a patient but hadn't been put in any patient. So I worked very hard um, to actually uh, get permission to do a special access patient one. And this is the, what it looked like before we put in the plaque and this is what it looked like after. This child has gone on with many more things and um, um, uh, we just still needed to do more, um, but is doing well today. So there are three trials in, um, in the cooker, um, and one in LA, one with Dan in Houston, and we're putting together one in Toronto as another phase one. They're all dif different and different patients. Um, I'll skip over this, except that maybe this chemo plaque will one day prevent the scar that we end up in uh, patients like Vincent van Gogh. So here's why green. These are all the things I've talked about. Because I'm over time, I won't go. I'll go right to the bottom. Strong collaboration, make retinal blastoma not so rare. And good retrospective studies with long follow-up and large N will change a lot of things. And new um, prospective, fully documented studies will achieve evidence for best care. Thank you very much. Sorry, these are all the people that really do the work and have done the work and they're color coded for what center they're in and the major donors, I, I have to point especially to Paul Finger's organization to help this all happen. Thank you very much, Dr. Galli. That was a brilliant lecture. Um, this, um, this keynote lecture is open for questions from the audience. Sir in the back. If you can give your name, please. Yeah, uh, Dr. Liu from China. A uh, uh, question to the panelists. Uh, last year, I have a very bad misdiagnosed case. Uh, the, the patient was a uh, four-year boy, came that presumed to be toxoclerosis because of, not only because of the clinical features, the attraction, vitreous haze, but also 
a, a very strong indication from the lab test that telling us that yes, uh, the lab test is positive for toxocariasis. I want you comment on the, the false positive lab test that, that might lead us to the misdiagnosis of retinal blastoma. I, I learned from the literature that the, the number one indication is that from the positive, uh, positive uh, a pulse, false positive test is the retinal blastoma. A question to the panelists. Yes, thank you. So I'll share with you the 15 year old case in our center, which mimics some of the challenges. And I discussed this case with enormous humility because sometimes people, like a panel like this, will say, You should have thought about this. And I, I completely disagree. These are just very sometimes very unfortunate cases, but this is a 14-year-old African-American male who was noted to have a granuloma or thought to have a granuloma and had an extensive workup by very smart people and ended up having a quantiferon a gold positive test and the diagnosis was tuberculosis. The, di the, the eye continued to be monitored, eventually went to bophthalmia, um, had a scleral melt and subsequently was enucleated. Because the presumptive diagnosis was um, uh, infectious, uh, the eye sat actually until the ocular pathologist looked at it for a couple of months because she was focused on more neoplastic concerns until the eye ultimately was looked at. Um, and of course it was retinoblastoma. And by the time we realized that the child already had CNS metastasis, we, and, and I don't think anyone would have thought about retinoblastoma in, you know, a 14, now 15 year old child. So these, these, there are, you know, these very, you know, challenging, unfortunate cases where, you know, we look for clues and sometimes the test that we have reinforces the wrong diagnosis. And I think we're always going to have that. There is going to be within the next year a very nice paper that has been submitted, will be published from the Children's Oncology Group. So for those of you that are, do a lot of pediatric work, you're familiar with COG. It's a, um, the, the largest NIH NCI sponsored consortium of pediatric oncologists designed to support prospective multi-center well-designed trials in pediatric oncology. Ira Dunkel led this particular trial looking at extraocular disease. And we always think of extraocular disease as um, something that's going to lead to death. And there are two encouraging aspects about this data which will come out. First of all, um, stage two, three, and four A disease, which is um, extraocular local or distant metastasis not involving CNS, the prognosis is not that bad with aggressive chemotherapy. So multimodal chemotherapy, often involving a stem cell transplant, we are starting to approach 70, 80% five-year survival for even stage 4E disease, so distant metastatic disease not involving the CNS. Where there is horrific prognosis with you know, very poor five-year survivor, we're looking at less than 10 to 15% five-year overall survival is with CNS metastasis. So I think there is some potential that in a case like yours, as long as we can get to it before it's in the CNS, we can recognize these patients, we can still potentially cure this patient with aggressive chemotherapy, and that paper is going to disseminate within the pediatric oncology community within the next year worldwide. Question uh, to, for Dr. Galley. Um, in the back, ma'am. Uh, hi, I'm Mike Shapiro from Chicago. Um, so I think that the most problematic rabbit hole for me is the, not, the parents who really seem to be dead set against the nucleation, in, whether it's unilateral or bilateral. And I think one of the most important points that you've made is the issue of losing survival while going down this rabbit hole. So how do you talk to the parents and prepare them for the possibility of how do you solve this problem for me? <laughs> so, I, I, um, we didn't ever used to have such problem to get eyes removed. And maybe I'll pass to Brian until the basketball player went 
public with unsubstantiated, no research to show its value, and the whole nation and the world thought we can save any eye with retinoblastoma. So that led the parents to put extraordinary focus on the eye, even without vision. And I think that's caused a lot of trouble worldwide. But I think, I think Depict Health might help that because the parents are invited to watch. They can see all the treatments that child's had and all the, they can look at other children, other example children, and see when they, they, you conduct, you work for two years to save an eye and then take it out anyway, having risked the child's life through that interval. All of that information in parents' hands, no parent wants their child to die. I think that might be a way to change it, but it is the, one of the major problems in care of retinal blastoma today. Thank you. So I'll just add to that. Um, I think it's really important to exercise the, the, the quality of the vision in those cases and say, you know, we can chemo a nucleate dry with all these technologies, but we're not really saving a functional portion of the patient's you know, existence. And you have to drill that home to them. Even though we can do it, there's, there's reasons not to do it. And it, it, the treatments are involved and painstaking. And if you can just kind of convince them that why are we doing this, and they can think a little bit about how to answer that, a nucleation is easily sold. I think also in the uh, era of social media, while we had some help for saving eyes from basketball players, unfortunately, and we've lost some children in this country from aggressive attempts to save eyes that should have otherwise been removed because the eye was blind and dangerous. And those are now really readily available in the newspaper, um, on Facebook. And so that's something I discuss with my parents as well, that, you know, I want to get your child um, to prom and to college and um, he or she can do that regardless of whether or not um, they have an eye, but they can't do it if they lose their life. There was a question in the back. I'm Linda Cernichal from Mexico City. Um, part of my practice is based on pediatric retina and tumors. And um, one of the new perspectives here, um, I would like to ask if you think at some point um, the acute humor biopsy will be helpful for those complicated cases as well that we always have questions whether it is or not a tumor. So um, right now, and I have to stress this, um, it is all research. So there is no current clinical test or clinical indications for the aqueous humor. I do, however, hope that it will be helpful. Um, right now, it's shown a lot of value in terms of prognosis. So which eyes are more or less likely to respond to therapy? Um, we and uh, a center in England have also shown the ability to detect RB1 mutations in the aqueous, um, which in a non-germline case could help with diagnosis. Um, that being said, again, right now, you know, if it takes eight or nine weeks to get the RB1 mutation, it's not a big deal because we're doing research. To be able to do that rapidly in a clinically useful manner is still not something we've achieved. Dr. Hartnett. The patients who ended up having pars plana vitrectomy, do you give like intra uh, systemic chemotherapy right before, or how, how? When when are you? Do you ever get worried that it's too active to resect it? Or these these um, eyes have all had systemic chemotherapy, and they're all for uh, failed. So they're recurrences and different things. Um, we don't give more systemic chemotherapy right before necessarily, and um, there are more than 700 of these done in China now, and there's no, no evidence of that. But we're only reporting the ones that have long follow-up. Um, but it, it doesn't seem to be a problem. And, but the um, um, irrigation fluid has melphalan in it at a low dose, and um, we take all, everything that comes out of the eye, we examine under the microscope. For example, that one I showed, the recent one we just did, we got a report on the cytology from the irrigation fluid that it had retinoblastoma tumor in it. But when we look at that slide, all the fluids on one cytology slide, um, 
it, it's because we resected the tumor. So it's an interesting view of a tumor that was irradiated um, a few months before with a plaque. <laughs> and and they don't look like active retinal cells to us. So, so I think it's, it's um, certainly there, you're, you're taking out cells. Along that line, um, Francis Mounier, just to um, Dan's comment on intravitreal melphalan, we sent one patient to Francis for different things, and he did uh, um, uh, the anterior chamber tap before intravitreal melphalan, and he, he um, not only sent it pathology, he grew it in tissue culture, and it had live retinal blastoma in it. It grew in tissue culture, and that led him to recognize that when you do that anterior chamber tap, you actually could be pulling cells from the back of the eye into the anterior chamber. That doesn't seem to be any problem for disease extent, and um, anterior disease is not a big problem, although we all thought it would be, but it shows, and Francis's response is now he does bicameral drug into the front and the back because maybe he's pulled some forward. So it, lots just, of things. Just a quick comment. When we do anterior chaps, all, as a, as a security check, everything is sent to our um, cytopathologist that day, and, and we have never detected any malignant cells in any um, AC tap that, that mm -hmm. we've done. So, uh, and, and that continues to be an internal control for us. That's our standard. Yes. I think it's safe to say that there's still a lot to be learned about the safety of employing vitrectomy. I saw everyone, all the vitreotinal surgeons, their eyes just kind of popped open <laughs> when you described it. Um, so I think there's, there's much that we're eager to learn uh, about how to manage this. Um, so again, thank you to Dr. Galley for a wonderful lecture. Thank you, Professor Valley. It's been outstanding um, work, and thank you for leading the way um, to improve care across the globe. Thank you. This is just a little bit of you guys to take back with you. Oh, wow. Um, we're, we can definitely ship it for you. It's a little heavy, but it um, is a beautiful piece of you talk. Oh, wow. Well, and he's been very so nice. I like that. Thank you very much. Thank you. 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 Thank you.